When you discover the collapsed patient, you first need to ensure that the scene is safe to approach. Ensure that all hazards are removed for additional rescuers coming to assist you and that all unnecessary equipment is removed as soon as reasonably possible. Assess the need for personal protective equipment such as gloves, aprons or splash masks according to the risks of each situation. This safety check includes ensuring that safe manual handling takes place. If the patient has collapsed anywhere other than on a bed or trolley, it may be safer to administer resuscitation on the floor. If the patient has collapsed in a smaller room such as a toilet, ensure they are moved into an accessible position to administer CPR using safe manual handling techniques and additional help where necessary before assessing the patient. Check the patient's level of consciousness by firmly shaking their shoulders and asking if they are okay in both ears to exclude hearing loss or any other condition which may lead them to initially appear unresponsive. Joan? Joan, Joan, can you hear me? Can you open your eyes? At this point, if you are on your own, you need to attract attention and get additional assistance if possible. This can be done by activating alarm bell or buzzer systems or by making a loud, clear appeal to attract attention, such as Can I have some help, please? Ensure you know how to lay any bed or trolley used in your clinical area into a flattened, lowered position to facilitate good quality chest compressions if required. Most beds or trolleys in clinical areas have CPR handles, levers or electronic buttons that carry out these actions. The unconscious patient lying on their back is likely to have a partial or complete airway obstruction due to loss of muscle tone in the pharynx, causing the tongue to fall backwards. Open the airway using the head tilt chin lift manoeuvre. Position yourself at 90 degrees to the patient's side and place one hand on the patient's forehead and two fingers under the chin. Tilt the head so the patient's chin is elevated and supported by the two fingers and head is stabilised by the palm on the forehead. If you know or reasonably suspect that the patient has a neck injury as a result of a witness fall or other injuries to the head and neck, use the jaw thrust manoeuvre. Place two fingers behind the angle of the mandible and push the jaw up towards the ceiling without extending or moving the neck. Assess the risk of employing this technique in patients with known facial fractures. If there is no indication or reasonable suspicion of neck injury, perform the head tilt chin lift manoeuvre. As you open the airway, you may briefly look into the mouth for any obvious obstruction. Large items, such as unsecured dentures, which are resting in the front part of the pharynx, may be easily removed at this point. Smaller objects or objects in the lower part of the pharynx are unlikely to be retrievable without specialist skills and equipment, and may actually be pushed further down during attempts to remove them, worsening airway obstruction or causing vomiting, as well as delaying CPR or other vital interventions. Positioned at 90 degrees to the patient's side, place one ear close to the patient's airway being held open by the head tilt chin lift manoeuvre and look, listen and feel for normal breathing. Look for respiratory effort down the line of the patient's chest, where possible removing excessive blankets or clothing, although this should not delay your assessment of the patient's breathing. Listen for any respiratory effort and try to feel any exhaled breath on your cheek. A small proportion of patients in cardiac arrest will make one or two reflexive wheezing or gasping respiratory efforts when their airway is opened. This is agonal gasping and should not be confused with normal breathing. A small proportion of patients will also demonstrate short, limited seizure-like activity at the point of collapse due to the sudden lack of oxygenated blood delivered to the brain. This is different to prolonged seizure activity in patients with conditions such as epilepsy who may require assessment and treatment, but not CPR. Careful assessment of the airway and respiratory effort will help you confirm the patient's condition. This assessment should take no more than 10 seconds. Do not perform a pulse check unless it is a clinical skill that you use regularly. If you have attracted assistance at this point and are in hospital buildings on the St Mary's site dealing with an adult patient in cardiac arrest, Send the other person to make an emergency call to summon more help and instruct them to bring back the resuscitation equipment, including the nearest defibrillator. This will be a 2222 cardiac arrest call to switchboard. Ensure that the location is relayed clearly and with as much detail as possible. An example of this could be... 
Cardiac Arrest, Medical Assessment Unit, D-Bay. Ensure the switchboard operator repeats the message back to you before terminating the call. Cardiac Arrest, Medical Assessment Unit, D-Bay. If you're in the community or outside of hospital buildings on the St Mary's site, instruct them to make a 999 call to ambulance control. If you are using a mobile phone to call 999, activate the speaker mode and place it next to the patient as you begin CPR. If you are on your own with an adult patient in cardiac arrest and have to go to a telephone to make an emergency call, it is at this point that you would leave them to use the telephone to make a 2222 cardiac arrest or a 999 call. Place one hand on top of the other, whichever way feels most natural. Interlink your fingers and place the heel of the bottom hand in the centre of the chest. This should be the only part of your hand in contact with the chest to minimise trauma. Positioned at 90 degrees to the patient's side, bring your shoulders vertically over the centre of the patient's chest. Ensuring that your shoulders are vertically over your hands and that your elbows are rigid, deliver chest compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 a minute, or roughly 2 a second. Compress the adult chest to a depth of 5 to 6 centimetres, allowing the chest to recoil naturally in between compressions to maximise efficiency. Do not allow your hands to leave the patient's chest while delivering compressions. Give 30 effective chest compressions. If the patient is on an air wave or any other pressure relieving mattress, ensure the emergency deflating toggle is pulled and begin CPR while it is deflating. The initial compressions will be less effective but a delay in beginning of CPR while the mattress deflates will adversely affect the patient's chances of survival. When an AED arrives at the patient's side, switch on the device immediately and follow the prompts without interrupting CPR. Apply pad to patient's bare chest. Peel off one pad at a time and apply it to the patient's chest wall according to the diagrams on the pads. One pad just below the right clavicle and the other pad on the left chest wall at approximately the level of the nipple in the mid axillary line. If the person providing CPR is compressing the chest in the right place, there is no need to interrupt CPR to place the pads. Attach the pads to the machine where the flashing light indicates and obey the instructions. Apply pads to patient's bare chest. There are several important considerations with regards to ensuring good pad contact and placement. In patients who have a lot of chest hair, enough hair must be removed to allow good pad contact with the chest. A razor is provided for this purpose, or a second set of pads where provided can be used to remove some of the hair. Clothing, including a bra, must be removed or cut off to allow rapid access to the chest, and tough cut scissors are provided for this purpose. Pad should not cover the nipple in an adult patient. Ensure the pad is applied to the chest wall and not to any breast tissue to reduce impedance and resistance from this tissue and to optimise current delivery to the myocardium. Any jewellery, such as necklaces, do not have to be removed, but must be moved out of the way and not covered by defibrillator pads. A dressing towel is provided to dry the area where the pads are to be placed. If the patient is clammy, has been sweating or is otherwise visibly wet. If you can see medication pads when you expose the chest, remove them. Rarely, patients may have an implanted cardiac device or ICD just under the right clavicle if they are left-handed. This will be present as a raised, firm object just under the skin with a scar over it. Defibrillator pads must not be placed over this device. Pads must not be placed over any skin divers or dermal anchors around the clavicular area. If you cannot place the pads on the right clavicle or left chest wall for any reason, the pads are placed in the bi-axillary or transthoracic position with one pad under each armpit in the mid-axillary line. Once the machine is on and the pads are attached, the AED will need to analyse the patient's cardiac rhythm to determine if a defibrillatory shock is required. Analyzing heart rhythm. Analyzing. Do not touch the patient. During this analysis, it is important that no one touches the patient. If the machine detects movement artifact, it will stop analyzing and need to begin again, delaying a shock and further CPR if needed. 
This will adversely affect the patient's chances of survival. If a shock is required, the machine will issue a verbal prompt that it is charging. Shock advised. Right, stay, clear, stay clear of patient. The person operating the defibrillator, regardless of their profession, grade or experience, is responsible for the safe use of the device. Ensure no one is in contact with the patient by conducting a 360 degree check of the space around the patient and clearly verbally indicate that you will be shocking the patient. Shock advised. Right, stay clear. Hands up, please. Stay clear of patient. When the defibrillator has charged, it will indicate that it is now ready to discharge the shock. Deliver shock. When it is safe to do so, having checked no other rescuers are in contact with the patient, clearly announce that you are shocking the patient and press the button to discharge the shock. Shock delivered. Pause. You can reduce the chance of accidental shock to other rescuers by keeping your hand away from the shock button until it is illuminated and it is safe to shock. Press it once firmly and withdraw your hand. It is now safe to resume CPR. Start it is safe CPR. to resume CPR in contact with defibrillator pads. Bear in mind extra safety requirements if the patient has collapsed in a shower, bath or on any wet surface. Ensure as much water is drained away as possible and that no rescuers are in contact with the patient via any standing water. In this case, the patient needs to be dried only where pads are going to be placed. The defibrillator will time you for two minutes before asking you to pause for an assessment of the patient's heart rhythm. Let the defibrillator time this two minute period and respond to the verbal prompts. Do not be confused by any event timer on the display screen. This measures the time since the device was switched on, including pauses for assessment and any delays. The verbal prompts will indicate when to begin and when to pause a two minute cycle of CPR. If you are becoming exhausted or are no longer able to provide effective chest compressions, plan to swap with another rescuer, perhaps at the next set of ventilations. Minimise delays in CPR, as delays of only a few seconds can cause a severe drop in blood pressure and adversely affect the chances of survival. If you have confirmed cardiac arrest and ensured that the cardiac arrest team are on their way or somebody else is calling the team and bringing the cardiac arrest equipment, Give compression-only CPR until you have assistance and equipment necessary to give two rescue breaths to every 30 compressions. Ensure the person managing the airway has adequate safe access to the patient's head by safely moving the bed out of the bed space slightly, removing a headboard where possible and removing any pillows to allow you to open the airway. For rescuers with non-specialist skills, the bag valve mask device is used with a two-person technique. Use the bag valve mask device with an oropharyngeal airway, or OPA, in the unconscious patient. These devices are measured using the vertical distance from the patient's incisor to the angle of their jaw. Find the OPA that best matches the size of the patient's airway, preferring too large over too small if in doubt. Insert the airway curving upwards into the patient's mouth and slide it back until you feel resistance. At this point, rotate the OPA 180 degrees until it rests comfortably in the patient's mouth with the flange resting on the patient's lips. At no point are you expected to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth breaths to any collapsed patient in your role as an NHS employee. Therefore, if you have no access to any airway rescue device or equipment, give compression-only CPR while summoning help or equipment including an AED. Attach the bag valve mask device to 15 litres per minute of oxygen as soon as possible and place the device on the patient's face. Narrow part over the nose, wider part between the bottom lip and the chin. Using two thumbs on the rigid part of the mask, press the mask down and use the four remaining fingers on each hand to lift the patient's jaw into the device to create an adequate seal. Alternatively, use the C and E grip using the thumb and forefinger of each hand to form the C shape to encircle the rigid collar at the joining of the mask to the bag and the remaining three fingers on each hand, forming an E-shape to pull the patient's face firmly up into the mask. Another rescuer then gives two firm ventilations by squeezing the bag. The bag contains 1.5 litres of gas, of which only about 500 to 600 mils, or a third, needs to be delivered. Squeeze the bag to bring fingertips together through the device and allow it to recoil. 
Give a second breath. Avoid excessive volumes of short, sharp, aggressive ventilations. This may cause vomiting or regurgitation, further compromising the airway. At the end of a two minute cycle, the automated external defibrillator will ask you to stop to perform further rhythm analysis. Stop CPR analyzing heart rhythm. Stay clear of patients. Analyzing heart rhythm. No shock advised. If the defibrillator says that no shock is advised, rapidly assess the patient for signs of life. Only if competent to do so should a pulse be palpated at any stage of a cardiac arrest event. If there are no signs of life, the patient is in a non-shockable rhythm. Recommence CPR as soon as possible and continue for two minutes at a ratio of 30 compressions to two rescue breaths for a further two minutes. If the patient demonstrates signs of life and a return of spontaneous circulation, do not remove the defibrillator pads or turn the device off. Assess the patient's airway, breathing, circulation and level of consciousness before exposing the patient to check top to toe for any injuries, rashes, swollen limbs or other important signs. This is the ABCDE approach. Consider the need to nurse the patient on their side and how this can be safely achieved. Hand over the patient to the arriving team using the Situation Background Assessment Recommendation or SBAR approach. In summary, ensure the scene is safe with attention to your personal safety and safe manual handling as observed. Check for a response. Shout for help to attract attention. Open the airway and look, listen and feel for breathing. If the patient is unresponsive and not breathing, this is a cardiac arrest. Leave the patient or send a colleague to make a double two, double two call in hospital building on the St Mary's site stating clearly cardiac arrest and your location with as much detail as possible. Wait for the operator to confirm the message and return to the patient. If outside hospital buildings on the St Mary's site or at any other community location, dial 999 and speak to the ambulance control operator. If you have a mobile phone with speaker function, activate it and place it next to the patient. Begin chest compressions at a ratio of 30 to compressions to two rescue breaths where you have equipment and skills to deliver rescue breaths. Give compression only CPR if you have no equipment but know that further help is on the way. Compress the chest five to six centimeters roughly twice a second, taking care to allow the chest to recoil and avoid moving your hands around the chest. When the defibrillator arrives, place the pads appropriately with no interruption of CPR, attach them to the device, switch the device on and obey the prompts. Apply pads to patient if advised to do so, safely shock the patient and resume CPR as soon as the shock is delivered. If there is no shock advised, rapidly assess the patient for signs of life and begin CPR if none are observable. If the patient shows signs of life, place them in the recovery position Give them oxygen and monitor them without removing or switching off the defibrillator.